please note that this video contains spoilers. The Three Musketeers, 2011, 3D Thoughts. So, wasn't going to give this away in the main, the spoiler-free review itself, but how about that diving equipment at the beginning? Oh my. Paul, yet again, has this penchant for things that probably sound good on paper, but when you actually put it to, commit it to the screen, yeah. I have a feeling that he thought that was going to look great, that that was going to be a really impressive thing. But when you actually watch the movie, it's a guy coming up out of the water and he has what appears to be an executioner's mask on. It, it just looks silly. You know, I don't think we would have even questioned the whole diving thing if he hadn't been wearing that ridiculous mask. And it's not like he's using it to get past anyone because he just shoots the people in front of him and then he takes it off, you know. And Mila's breasts greet him and you have to wonder why it was that he even, what did he even do that was important because it's just her handing him the key. I guess they wanted a flashy way of showing that, you know. I. I would personally think they could have met somewhere else. It would have been easier than killing guards and probably attracting more attention than necessary, but whatever. I did already in the review itself point out the strong resemblance to Assassin's Creed. Methinks Paul had been playing some Ubisoft around the time he was working on ideas for this. It would actually be... You know, if it wasn't so inappropriate for the Three Musketeers, you know, the whole honorable, you know, symbols of honor kind of thing, and it wasn't such a direct ripoff, it would actually be quite awesome. Okay, it's still awesome, but it is a ripoff. So, around the time... Comic Relief. Fat Comic Relief, Fat Unfunny Comic Relief, gets seasick, airsick, whatever, we realize that there is another airship, you know, and it does make sense because the king did say, why don't I have one of those, and, you know, sure, why didn't they, you know, why not have another one? However, why do they that why do they not just shoot them down out of the sky? You know, why does Rochefort and you know his minions not just shoot the ship out of the sky? Is it that important that what would they what do they think is going to happen with the jewels if they shoot down the ship? Do they think that somehow everyone, you know, at least someone on board is going to survive, grab the jewels and still make it all the way back to France in time? They're already against the clock. You know, we realize that it is the day of the party. It is the day of the ball. They have almost no chance of getting back. All of Rochefort and his guys have to do is shoot them out of the sky. That would be it. And they just keep not shooting them out of the sky. You know, they wait until the last moment. And when they finally do start shooting, we get the, the Paul W. Sanderson. It's almost overpowering. He yet again sets up this big event and then he does not follow through on it. The problem with having the 2.0 version of the flying ship by Da Vinci is that it then has to be powerful enough to actually blow the other ship. You know, when ships fight at sea, you know, back in the pirate days, which I guess he halfway wanted to make a pirate movie, it would not actually take that many shots from a can from cannons for one ship to, you know, render the other ship pretty yeah, broken and, you know, couldn't really fight back anymore. 
here, you know, full blast, plenty of... And what does it do? I guess it shoots off the railing or something. There's even, you know, he even shoots bombs into, you know, where Fat Comic Relief is standing. And I'm thinking, okay, he's, you know, gonna pull that cliche of it's gonna get thrown back and, you know, haha. -ha. But no. And still the ship is, you know, okay, it's not in perfect shape anymore, but still he doesn't follow through on it. It's not, the ship is not powerful, as, as powerful as it ought to be. And then just gotta comment on the deliciously ridiculous design on the minigun cannon thing. That thing fires in all directions. That's wasteful and potentially hazardous to your own ship. You you know you might hit something of your own use that you know it's just it's ridiculous but yeah that's Anderson. I will say that I quite liked the idea of two ships, two airborne ships like that, fighting. In it it was a compelling visual. One I don't think I will soon forget. And when they then go into the you know, the cloud, and, you know, Rochefort, of course, you know, pulls the Wesker, and, you know, I will shoot anyone who disobeys my orders or refuses to, you know, whatever. I'm not even sure he made up that cliché, but he sure does like it. And recently, anyway. So, you know, again, that was pretty interesting, having them you know, one of the ships hide from the other. And then they start firing on Rochefort's ship, and I'm just thinking, hey, do they realize that D'Artagnan is still aboard? You know, they, they might actually kill him. And even if they don't kill about the young one, the diamonds are aboard Rochefort's ship, and if they don't get the diamonds, he kind of failed, because that's actually the main thing. Even if the Three Musketeers die, even if D'Artagnan dies during the course of this, the main thing is that the jewels get back to the Queen before the ball. That's really the main thing. And again, that's why you have to wonder why Rochefort is so, you know, so determined to get them back. He doesn't need them. He has no use for them, he just needs them to not be on the Queen, you know. So yeah, now the duel between Rochefort and D'Artagnan was pretty epic. You know, what? just once they're standing on the roof there, and it's like line dancing, and they're fencing, that was fantastic, you know, and D'Artagnan falls down, and you think it's over, and then, you know, he, you know, he just barely, barely makes it, excuse me, and they continue fighting, just the whole thing, and how he actually wins, even though Rochefort fights dirty, you know, with, you know, the little stabby dagger. couple of things that, briefly about the dagger, I guess the person who taught D'Artagnan's father, who I guess is D'Artagnan? I don't know. I suppose he learnt it from the intense musketeer. I apologize, I cannot remember their names. The, the intense one, the Angus McFadden one. He seemed to also use that. So I'm thinking he taught D'Artagnan's father. But that's never actually mentioned or really, you know, followed up on, brought up, anything. So, yeah. Now, I have to comment on the very last scene. Paul? Stop. I'm not even sure 
if you want. It's sequel baiting, but I can't tell if you're actually hoping for a sequel, or you're just saying, you know, you just want to leave it off, where it's, you know, more could happen. Here's the problem. At the end of the movie, clearly there will be a war between England and France. Say it with me, Paul. What were the musketeers, all four of them, trying to prevent? That's right, war between England and France. The whole movie was just rendered pointless by that one scene. Are you proud of yourself? It's just... You've done this to us before, Paul, and... I'm just about putting my foot down. This is... it's just... Just stop. Please, do not make a station intervention. Anyway, a couple of more or less minor things here and there. We do have a scene establishing that Richelieu can fight. We don't have one for Roquefort, who I guess is named after the French cheese. Why then does Richelieu never actually have a duel or any kind of fight with anyone, you know, actual, only the practice match, and yet Roquefort does have an important fight. You know, it's not established until that point that he can even fight. You know, he keeps talking about how he's always fighting dirty. You know, and another thing where something is, you know, Paul doesn't take the consequence of something that he really wants in the movie. He has Roquefort shoot D'Artagnan. And then it's like, oh wait, why didn't that kill you? You know, he realizes that it's too stupid that he shouldn't have the characters actually mention it. And then it's like, oh, uh, the site was wrong. And then I guess the guy next to him is responsible for the site being off, so he smacks him. And then, you know, rather than, you know, continuing with, you know, d d didn't other people in the area have pistols? Anyway, he, you know, he goes for the blade, and, you know, only because of Mila is he saved. So. Also, on the whole, you know, blade thing, I do like that they, you know, poke at the audience with the sword there. That's nice. After D'Artagnan kills Rockford, he leaves the blade in him. That was his father's blade. That was a musketeer's blade. Why didn't he just pull it out, you know, re retain it? Now he has to go find the body and, you know, pull the sword out. That's, you know, that's never seen. Why would he risk losing the sword, the sword maybe even breaking? It's a big deal. It was something his father gave to him. It was, you know... It could not have been more obvious that the letter for Mila that the that Richelieu, you know, made was going to be used for something else. It was way too vague, you know. Not, you know, the lady carrying this, you know, not even that. Much less, you know, Milady here, you know, was acting under my orders. No, just yeah. Wow. It just that could not have been more obvious. I suppose that's more or less what there is to say about the movie. Yeah, that pretty much covers it. So, yeah. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.